the, um, this started in um, 2013 um, at, I think, Code Mesh in, in London. Um, I say I think Code Mesh because Francesco changes the names of the conferences every year. <laughs> and so w when, you, when you're referring to a previous conference, you can never quite remember what it was called. And if he'd read my blog, you should really name the conferences by the SHA1 check some of the title. <laughs> and then it would be immutable, and, and you'd always be able to find it in the future. Anyway, this was Code Mesh in uh, 2013. And, and Francesco's a very good cook, actually. The thing you don't know about Francesco, he's, he's a mean cook. That was because he was a, a short order cook in the university. I mean, he was earning a bit of extra money in his spare time as a cook. Is that right? At Uppsala. Is he very good at cooking? Well, he's Italian, right? So very good at cooking. And um, what happens at these conferences is uh, quite often he says, OK, so conference over on a Friday, chill out party at Francesco's place, and, and you feel very privileged to be invited. And he invites some of the speakers back there, and, and you have a few beers and things. And now, uh, you relax. You know, the conference over, you've done your talk, everything's fine. And it was this conference, I, I sat down, and um, I can't remember who, who told me, but, but they said that, um, that Alan Kay was going to give a keynote at Strange Loop. And... Uh, I thought, I'd, all, I'd never met Alan Kay, and I, I thought, um, I got this idea in my head. I thought, um, I, I, I'd like to interview Alan Kay on stage. Um, and, and why would I want to do that? Well, it goes back to the old grey whistle. Does anybody know the old grey whistle test? No, sorry, it's not the old grey whistle test. <laughs> my memory's gone. Uh, Late Night with Jules Holland, or whatever. What's it called, that? Yeah, something like that. So Jules Holland, for those of you who don't know, is a jazz pianist. And uh, he has this show in, in Britain, and he interviews people. So he invited Elton John uh, to be his guest. Uh, and um, it was a fantastic interview. Because, um, you know, the first question was, was like, you know, what was your... F you know, the normal interviews with Elton John, what was your first album, and, and you know, when was your first break, and all that kind of crap. Uh, and, and Jules Holland says... You were highly influenced by, you know, somebody who's... N no, I'd never heard... I play the piano, I'd never heard of this person. And for once, Elton John went, oh, yeah. You know, and, and they had this lovely conversation, and I thought, I thought I'd like to do that with, with Alan Kay and, and, and ask him about um, his influences and, and things. So, um, so I mailed Alex Miller and, and, said, and suggested this as, a, as an idea for a talk or for a keynote thing on stage. And he, he mailed back and said, yeah, that, that, that'll be cool, and uh, we'll do that. And, and that's what, that was planned for 2013. And then a um, month later or something, uh, I got mail from Alex saying, uh, Alan Kay pulled out of that, and, um, and uh, yeah, would you, would you like to give the keynote at Strange Loop? Because we'd lost a speaker. And so I, I gave the keynote at Strange Loop, and uh, that didn't happen. But I, has, I still had the idea in my head. And then in, I was trying to contact Alan. He's very friendly if you mail him. You get mail back immediately. And uh, uh, we arranged to meet for the first time here in, in uh, 2016. I, I held a course here um, earlier in the week. And um, I was doing the same thing in, in sorry, yeah, in 2016. And uh, Alan Kay had arranged to come and, and we could have a conversation. If he wanders in and um, Francesco had never met me, Francesco wanted to meet him, so Francesco is holding a course in the room up there and, and uh, we wander in through the back. And uh, Francesco sees both of us wander in, and doesn't bat an eyelid, he just says, and now we'll take a 10 minute coffee break and smiles. Everybody turns around and it's me and Alan Kay have wandered in and, and we start talking. And uh, so that year we, we invited him to. Um, uh, London, because he, he was in London, and, and asked, uh, want to do this interview thing or, or thing. And so I thought, what the hell am I going to ask him? <laughs> you know, th he's my great hero, you know, he's uh, had a lot of really good ideas. He's the, he's the guy who invented object, or he coined the term object-oriented programming. He's the guy who persuaded Steve Jobs to, to build the iPad. And he's the, I he's the guy who's had a hell of a lot of ideas. So, so I thought, so, so what do I ask him? 
And, uh, and um, so I thought, yeah, I'll ask him what, what the good ideas they had back in the 70s, and the late 60s that we've forgotten. So that was a genesis of this stream of thought. What are the, what are the good ideas we've had and, 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 and we've forgotten? And uh, I, I tried to ask him that. But, you know, if you get somebody like Alan Kay on stage, you ask them X and they answer Y instead. So, so it, it, it was a mixture of history and uh, what he wanted to say. And, and then we thought, well, that's okay. So we did it. Larry Wall came along and I again asked him uh, what were the forgotten ideas. And every time I met one of my colleagues, some professor here and there, I, I, um, I said, you know, what, what have we forgotten? I wasn't writing these things down at the time. I, I thought, they're just in my head. What, what have I myself forgotten? So I started writing these things down. And then I thought, mm, I'll tweet, because I'm preparing a talk. Um, not this talk, actually. It's, this, this is a prototype of a talk that, that I'll give um, in Chicago later on in the year. And, and actually, the, 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 probably the title's misleading. A better title might be, what, what are the ideas? Uh, what? For might? You see, it's a prototype. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I was doing it on the plane and, and last week. Uh, oh, the, uh, sorry, the ideas we might have forgotten or never knew or needed reminding of or should have forgotten. I mean, I can't say that they're forgotten ideas. We, you might have never known them, so you can't have forgotten them if you never knew them. So they might be completely new ideas, uh, whatever. Or, or they might just be silly ideas. They should be forgotten ideas. Um, anyway, so I tweeted. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Um, oh, good. It's a sort of blank slide. So these are the forgotten ideas in computer science. <laughs> this is supposed to be completely black. On, on the slide, it's black, but it, should, it doesn't come out in black. But never mind. OK, so, and, and I would say this, this, is, this is work in progress with an awful lot of personal bias. <laughs> uh, let, let's go on a bit here. So, so the, the, plan of, the plan of this talk is, first of all, the, the motivation to the talk. Uh, what, I've given a bit of that already. And, and, and then it's going to turn out to be some things we should learn, I think. And, and these, are, these are sort of a, a mixture of the forgotten ideas and things that should be forgotten. And so I, I'll explain as I go along. And, and then doing computing is not just computer science. It's other stuff you should know. And then it's the sort of big stuff that we've really forgotten. Uh, 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 and then what, what, what we can do about it? What, what should we go? What can we do then? And it, this, is a bit, this bit will take, part two will take a long time. And I haven't rehearsed this, and I don't know how long it's going to take. So, <laughs> so you know, if I'm, if I'm like in the middle of that and there's 10 minutes to go, can somebody like do play windmills? Promise? Good. Who's going to do windmills? You're going to do windmills. Great. OK. So motivation. Motivation. Well, how, how is this all motivated? Well, I, I have to think about the things I've forgotten and, and what we've achieved in the last few years. So back in the 1980s, when I, when I, was, when I joined the lab, I, th I thought, what, 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 what problems should we solve? What are the big problems to solve? That's what I asked in 90 because I had to give a talk. I go back to my talks of the 1980s. What problems do I want to solve? Well, I thought I'd write down three problems. How do we find things? How do we store things? And how do we program things? That seemed a, a, a good thing. So I had a plan. Learn Emacs. Learn Unix. And learn a programming language. That were my personal goals when I joined the computer science lab. So what happened? <laughs> I didn't learn Emacs. And I didn't learn Unix, and I invented a new programming language. <laughs> right. So, so what's the progress? Well, there has been a small amount of progress on these problems in the last 30 years. So, so finding things is actually better than it was back in the 1980s. So Google and all these good people have made it easy to find things. Of course, can't find everything, but it's a lot better. And it's getting better all the time. Uh, it's also getting worse. Uh, and I'll explain the reasons for that in a bit later. 
Uh, saving things is getting slightly better. Dropbox and friends. Uh, but they're not that good. I mean, it's still going to be, we have to save it until the sun becomes a red giant and then we're done. But so I've got to store it on DNA or something like that. And I keep going, I keep asking these people, you know, you know this stuff on Facebook? My images? Will, will my, gen, you know, if I grandchildren, great, will they be able to find these images? They're encrypted in the cloud. And I asked a technical guy at Facebook who's fairly high up, and he said, he said, that's a very good question, Joe, a very good question. We're just in danger of losing our history. we will store this stuff for a long time. Um, programming things. Have we got better at programming things in the last 20 years, 25 years? Uh, I think the answer would be no. <laughs> Actually, there have been no... Well, there have been some small improvements. Everybody thinks that, that advances in computer science are quick, but they're not. If you take, like, the Lambda calculus, you know. The Lambda calculus is great, invented around about 1930. When did they put lambdas into Java 8? Last year or something? I mean, <laughs> progress is very, 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 very slow. But you wouldn't get that impression if you see everything. It's, oh, the latest thing is fantastic. Well, I think it's very slow. So what, what problems should we solve now? Right, so I've changed my agenda. Okay, so, um, so there's, there's too much stuff. I mean, once upon a time, there wasn't enough stuff. And, and then, right about the mid-80s, there was about enough stuff. And now there's too much stuff. I mean, take programming languages, for example. Round, round about... Around about 19, I started programming in, in like 76. Uh, there wasn't enough stuff. If, if you define stuff to be programming languages, there was Fortran and COBOL and Fortran. <laughs> and that wasn't enough stuff. Uh, you get to the mid 80s, there was enough stuff. There was C and there was Fortran and there was Pascal and there was things. And now there's 250, 500, 800 programming languages and one new one each week. There's far too many of them. And, and for a beginner, that's incredibly confusing. I mean, of all, the, and every, all of them are saying, I'm great, this is the greatest language since smoked cheese. And how can you choose? And we've invented all this stuff. The Internet of Things and, and, and uh, what, are, what are we going to do with it all? Right. Do we really need to hijack our attention systems every 10 seconds with a banner? <laughs> I, 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 I can't do flashing text in, in uh, oh, maybe I can do flashing text in Keynote, but, but really I should be, I should have notifications turned on and big flashing, you know, if Trump sneezed, I say, I mean, this is really important. You know, oh my God, Trump sneezed. My God. This is not a new phenomenon. I, 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 I'm minded of um, uh, Forau, who in 1854 said, and as with our colleagues, so with a hundred modern improvements, there is illusion about them. There is, there is not always a positive advance. Our inventions are wont to be pretty toys, which distract us from our attention, from serious things. And about... I don't know what Thor would, would have said about um, notifications. <laughs> because he was complaining about the penny post. <laughs> because the penny post was sending news. And as he said to a philosopher, all news as it is called is gossip. And they who edit and read it are old women in their tea. And as for England, Almost the last significant scrap of news from that quarter was the revolution of 1649. <laughs> and he's writing it in 1854. So, you know, he didn't really think that the penny post was an advantage because it was sending him trivia that, that were distracting him from the important things of life. And I don't think he would have liked instant messaging and, and, and notifications and things. Okay, so the methodology for what I was going to do Ask some questions, get some replies, organize a result, choose the best things to do. Started here, uh, Code Mesh, the videos online, if you can see it, that was quite fun. And my question then was what ideas have we forgotten? Um, I said that, uh, let's ask some well known pe people, let's ask everybody. And then I tweeted, 
I'm interested in the forgotten ideas in computer science, needed for a talk. Can you post examples of, of CS ideas that have been forgotten? Example, Linda Tupel. I put Boyer Moore in there, and everybody say, ah, oh, nobody's forgotten Boyer Moore. How many of you have forgotten Boyer Moore? Uh, so all the rest, how many don't, have never heard of Boyer Moore? <laughs> right, there you go. <laughs> Proof of concept. <laughs> you don't know what Boyer Moore is, bloody hell. Find somebody with grey hair, take them in a corner, and ask them what Boyer Moore is, and they will tell you. <laughs> if they were paying attention <laughs> 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. So I tweeted this, and, and the next day I had a little look to see what had happened. And, and I got this, like, 236,204 engagements. I haven't a clue what an engage... No, impression. I don't know what an impression is. Apparently, impression means somebody sort of clicked on it and looked at that tweet. So, so it had reached 200... You know, sort of 236,000 people had done this. This advantage of having Twitter followers, whenever I get stuck, I ask them the question there, and it's really great, actually. So please follow me, so that when I have problems, which I have all the time, I can ask you guys and you can reply. <laughs> this is, I tell you, you know what I do when I'm solving problems? First of all, I Google, 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 then I can't solve it, and then I tweet and say, how do you do this? And that is much better than searching in Google. But you have to have a few followers for that to work, so it's, it's really good. Right, and the next day, uh, when I woke up, I looked, and, and uh, there was this little thing, 277. So um, that's the number of people who had replied. And I turned that into a PDF. I wanted that in a PDF file so I could save it. And of course, I couldn't figure out how to save this as PDF. So I had to tweet, how the hell do you save this stuff? Because it's not obvious. <laughs> and, and yeah, somebody told me. And I, I turned it into PDF, and it was 56 pages of stuff. Uh, uh, oh, I thought, hey, hey, hang on. This is fun. So I asked some more questions. I thought, hey, what? what Interested in the silly ideas, I thought, um, hey, um, why, why just ask about the forgotten ideas? Let's ask about the silly ideas. Yeah, what ideas? I mean, we think the stuff they thought, you know, that stuff, some of the stuff they did 20 years ago, really stupid. How could they be so... So what, you know, in 20 years' time, what, what, are, what, are, what are people going to say of today? What's really, 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 really stupid? I got a few replies. So what started as forgotten ideas, became forgotten ideas, silly ideas, hot research topics, money-making ideas, bad ideas, socially good projects, and, and so on. I started tweeting about this and collecting information. And uh, so then what do you do with it? I want to sort this stuff. And, and this became what I would call the essential guide to computer science, or what you need to learn, or a guide for the, confu for the confused. So now I'm trying to make this into a list, or rather a list of lists. And, uh, <coughs> well, how to make a list? Well, collecting the data, that's the easy bit. Sorting it into categories is slightly more difficult. And shortening the lists is the most difficult part. That's the really difficult part. It's what to omit is the difficult part. And I was thinking to myself, this is... One thing I learned throughout my professional life, um, if, if somebody puts a big list of things up, my question is always, what is the most important thing on that list? So I remember in Ericsson, um, there was a young project manager and he's telling us about the glorious future of three, 5G. And he puts up a slide, of remote medicine, self-driving cars, internet of things. Da, da, da. I mean, <laughs> like this. And so I said, excuse me, what's the most important thing? He says, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I can only implement one thing at a time. I'm, you know, I'm a one thing at a time person. So if you give me that huge list of things, I will implement the most important thing. Which is it? He didn't know. So whenever you've got a big list of things, just ask the person, what's the most important thing? We can't do, if you see a list of 20 things, you can't do 20 things in parallel. You can do one of them, and you do the next. So what's the most important thing? And, and I, again, I thought, lists of books. If, if you're teaching computer science, you know, for, if the professor hands out a list of 20 books to read, that's a cop-out. Because no student's going to read 20 books. But for the teacher, it's OK, because the teacher can say, I've handed out a list of 20 books. 
If the student chose the wrong books, that's the student's fault. It's not my fault, because I have given them a list of 20 books. But if they hand out a small list, then they become responsible. They haven't handed out 20 books. They have chosen them. So I've tried to reduce these lists to a very small number of things. I'm going to recommend some papers to read, some books to read, some things like that. And I'm not, I'm not recommending them. They are rec personal recommendations. I have read the books I'm recommending, and there's not a big list. And I'm going to recommend some programs. So this could be the basis of a computer science course or something, because it's the forgotten ideas and the new ideas. And so here's the... How are we doing for time? This is a big list of what? 20 minutes! Bloody hell. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. OK, so there were 80 things in, 80 things in 18 categories. And I, this is an experimental lecture. It, it, it might be a book. You know, if you all put your hands up, I might write a book and, and uh, I'll organize it that way. So it's 18 things, 80 things in 80 categories. So two great papers to read, four old tools to learn, five to three book, but you'll read the slides later. Right. Um, OK, we'll start. Two great papers to read. A Plea for Lean Software by Nicholas Viet and The Emperor's New Clothes. Anybody read them? One or both? Were they good? <laughs> yeah, come on, say yeah. yeah. Yes, right. All the ones who haven't read them, read them. OK, they're good. So what does Viet say? The belief that complex systems require armies of designers and programmers is wrong. A system that is not understood in its entirety, at least to a single degree of individual of detail by a single individual, should probably not be built. It's very good advice. Reducing complexity size must be the goal at every step. To gain experience, there is no substitute for one's own programming experience. This is very good advice. What's Tony Hoare say? Tony Hoare, Tony Hoare's a more conversational style. It's, it's a very nice, readable paper. It's a Turing Award lecture. And uh, I remember this. I read it years and years ago. And uh, uh, this guy, Andrew, he, he had just been project manager of a big project that failed. And the managing director of the company stormed into his office and shouted. This guy's called Andrew St. Johnson. I was surprised that he'd ever heard of me. You know what went wrong? He shouted. He always shouted. You let your programmers do things which you do yourself not understand. I stared at this in astonishment. He was obviously out of touch with present reality. How could one person understand the whole system? I realized later he was absolutely right. He had diagnosed the true cause of the problem and he had planted the seed of its later solution. When I worked at Ericsson, the managing director of a big project, I mean, the, we got a new managing director. He, his first day, he stood there. And he said, does anybody understand the entire system? If so, please come and talk to me. And nobody put their hand up. That was serious. In the LN group, if somebody had asked that question, several hands would go up. We have to understand things in their entirety. If you push the little bits you don't understand to the side and think you'll solve them later, it's very, very dangerous. You must, you must, your first question must always be, what is the most difficult part of this problem that I'm trying to solve, and then try and solve that. If you can't solve the most difficult bit, give up. Seek advice. Find somebody who can solve it. It's going to fail your project. If you take the easy bits first, deliberately, because you can't solve the difficult bit, your project will fail late, rather than failing early, and your company will lose lots of money. Right. Two good papers. Um, I'm not going to get through all these this rapidly, so we'll do it very quickly. Four old tools to learn, Emacs, Bash, Make, and Shell. <laughs> you could use VI. I'm not religious here. <laughs> Make's pretty damn good. I use Make for everything. I don't use a different build system for every programming language I use. I use Make for everything. It's good. Call the system oh, yeah. Right, four really bad things. Uh, I'll only talk about one of them here. Vendor lock-in. We've been locked into platforms. You go to a big conference, half of them are going around, dot net, dot net, dot net, dot net, dot net, dot net, dot net. And there's another lot, JVM, 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 JVM. And they can't talk to each other. 
I'm running Google, I'm on Apple's platform, I'm on Google, I've got this Apple, and look at the iPad, all these things locked in, locked in, locked in. We have given everybody supercomputers. This, this thing is like 200, maybe I can't remember the numbers, 2,000 times the capacity of a Cray-1. So this is more powerful than the sum total of all the supercomputers in the 1980s. And what's happened, they've made it so it's so bloody difficult to program that we can't use it, <laughs> basically. And you've got to use these Xcode or whatever it's called, and these appallingly horrible things to do the simplest of things. And then there's terms of condition, you know, sorry, I, I wanted to show of hands here. Hands up everybody who's read the terms and conditions and, and understands them. Right, I thought so. <laughs> Hands up everybody, I just clicked on accept. Right. <laughs> this, is, this is nuts. This is nuts. Okay, three, three great books to read. Algorithms plus data structures equals programs by Nicholas Viet. Uh, the Mythical Man Month. And How to, friend, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. The, the, the first book is all you need to know. That's not all you need to know about computer science, but that book has got a P-code interpreter in Pascal, and uh, that is basically the JVM or the .NET virtual machine or the Erlang virtual machine to start with. <clears throat> it's got everything you need to know. Uh, it's got theory of parsing. It's how to go from syntax diagrams to code. And it's very, it's written for a programmer or a beginner. Viet is the most talented computer scientist on the planet. He's the only person who has made a programming language, well, several actually. Actually, not really, because Pascal and Modular 2 and, and Oberon are pretty much the same. Slight tweaks. So he's invented a programming language. He's written an operating system, and he's built the chips. So he's the only person who masters chip design, operating system design, and language design. Other people like me, we've only done a language, you know, we haven't done an operating system and a chip. Mind you, he did start doing his operating system when he was about 65 or, or something, 70, so, uh, you know, there's hope for us yet. You know. uh, it's really good. The Mythical Man Month. Who's read the first one, by the way? Just kind of cool. Who, who hasn't read it? Who's never heard of it? Okay, so there's hope for you. And the Mythical Man Month, that's the only book you need to read about software management. It's really great. It's kind of, it just points out the fallacy of partitionable and non-partitionable jobs. You know, project managers think, if, you do, if you're in this project manager space and you think, um, I want to have a baby in a month, okay, let's, let's, let's get nine women. <laughs> having, having a baby is a non-partitionable task. Soft, uh, lof, often software is a non-partitionable task. It's a head full for one person and it takes a certain amount of time. If you try and split it into multiple heads it, it, with the illusion that it's going to speed it up, it just doesn't work. So that's not good. And then there's how to friend, win friends and influence people. This has got nothing to do with programming. This is about the human, about hu how humans interact. It's, it's ways to persuade people to do things. It's the mistakes you make and how, how, to, um, how to alleviate them. And, and I, I read this book and, and uh, used some of the things in it. <laughs> Over a beer, you can ask me what. They were very effective, though. And, and actually, right back in, in the, I, I've completely changed my mind. In, in the 90s, 80s, you know, I'd say, I'd say an argument was, was all about the technology. As an engineer, we, we argue the technology. And Dale Carnegie would say, no, 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 it's not about that. Um, and Jane Varlerud, uh, who, who was with us when we formed Blue Tail, she used to say, it's all about the relationship. She said, the relationship comes first. Um, and I'd go, no, Jane, no, 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 it's a technology. No. We had long arguments over this. But then, you see, I saw her getting results that I couldn't get. <laughs> she, th she thought you had to be friends with people. I thought you had to out-argue them. <laughs> so she said, you know, first you make friends with people, and then you out-argue them. Right. Um, how, how are we doing for time? Terribly. Ten minutes. 
OK, so I'll show them. They'll be on camera, and there'll be a PDF file. So I'm going to, oh, yeah. I, I'm gonna, I, I do have to slow down. This is one fun programming exercise. Get a syntax-oriented compiler writing language by D.V. Shorey. Seriously fun, might damage your brain. Dan Ingalls tipped me off on this. He said, don't read it. It's like a virus in your brain. Once you've read it, a month of your life will vanish in a black hole. And it did. <laughs> this is seriously good fun. Does anybody know this paper? One person. Isn't it fun? Yeah, he's nodding. Anybody not know it? Right. A month of your life is going to vanish down a drain hole when you read it. It's seriously cool stuff. Notice my lists are short. Uh, I, I would. Maybe, maybe this would be a book, Eight Great Machines from the Past. Uh, these are things you can learn from. Um, performance improvements. Three great performance improvements. Better algorithms. I reckon that gives you a factor six. This is the Erlang experience. Better algorithms probably gave us a factor six in performance. Changing the programming language, going from prologue to C, that gave us a factor 50. All the rest comes from hardware. So wait 10 years, you've got a 1,000. Wait 20 years, you get a million improvement in hardware performance. So basically, if, if you're trying to fiddle around with your code to make it efficient, that's the wrong thing to do. Keep on track of the latest hardware. That's the right thing to do. Wait for the hardware to get faster. Airlines got faster because of gigahertz clocks, not because we're smarter. Five YouTube, five plus YouTube videos to watch. Um, this is kind of the theme of a lot of stuff. Alan Kay has a, a, a talk on YouTube. The computer revolution has not happened yet. It's a kind of provocative title, but he explains why. And a lot of people think the computer revolution has happened. I, agree, I happen to agree with Alan. I don't think it's happened yet. We're starting it. It hasn't happened. Now, if you go back even further, further back than Alan Kay, you get to Ted Nelson. Google computers for cynics. You will find he's got about five things there. Only 2,000 people have watched them. It's a very small number of people who watch this stuff. Ted Nelson's the guy who invented hypertext. Um, Tim Berners-Lee has implemented like half a, not half a percent, a very small percentage of Ted Nelson's ideas. Uh, these are good things. Um, six things not to do. F five sins. <laughs> oh, you should have seen my list before I got it down to five. <laughs> Perhaps if I write a book, it'll be in the appendix. You know, 252 stupid things that people do. <laughs> right, uh, five sins. Four languages to learn. Uh, Four great forgotten ideas. Now, I'm, I'm putting things in red. They're more important than the others. Uh, Linda Tuple Spaces, uh, something called Flow-Based Programming by John Paul Morrison, uh, and Xandu by Ted Nelson. And Unix Pipes, of course. I haven't really forgotten about Unix Pipes, but they've been destroyed, really. Um, let me just say something about Pipes. <clears throat> um, the great Unix philosophy was the output of my program should be the input to your program, so you can pipe things together. Uh, so text flows across this boundary in Erlang. Uh, it's easier because messages flow across the boundary. There's no parsing. In my opinion, these were killed by GUIs. You see, you don't have a text flow into a GUI and a text flow out of the GUI. So things that are GUIs, you can't pipe together in sequences. So that's killed the notion of a pipe, and it's killed the notion of reusing things. So do away with GUIs. They're horrible. Yeah. Right. Oh, and applications. They're horrible things. Um, you're locked inside your apps, and they all do different things with varying degrees of success. You know, each one is kind of buggy and has got, and, you know, how do, I, how do I transfer a file from this app to that app? Well, you can't. Oh, I know. You can send it via email to Dropbox, and the NSA can have a quick peep at it while it's on its way. And, and, uh, well. uh, six areas to do research into. Uh, yep. Precision medicine, this was, this was great. Good stuff. We can use machine learning to <laughs> diagnose diseases and things. We don't need to use machine learning to target advertisements to people. We can use it to cure their cancers. Just think about that. That's great. Security, we need secure devices. 
Two dangers, groupthink, bubblethink. Uh, four ideas are obvious now, but strange at first. It's kind of funny. Indentation. For, programming in Fortran 4 by Daniel B. McCracken. Daniel hadn't thought of indenting the code. Uh, you know, and then people started indenting code. Hey, that's a good idea. Versioning. Nobody thought that was a good idea. Hypertext across my pipes. Um, oh, two fantastic programs to try. The Tiddly Wiki, more about that later, and Sonic Pi. Um, could you do me a favor and tweet, um, tweet, tweet both of these immediately, all of you, so as to surprise uh, Jeremy Rushton, who's written the Tiddly Wiki. He needs a lot of love, you know, and, and Sam Aaron. And if you, if, you, if you tweet Sonic Pi, Joe's telling me to use the Sonic Pi, everybody go out and use Sonic Pi. And s same for Tiddly Wiki. They'll get a storm of tweets and wonder what's happened, and it'll be a big surprise. So do that, please, you know, because they need a lot of, a lot of, they need all the support they can get. And, and I would say that an hour spent, an hour of your life, that's not much to ask, an hour spent using the Tiddly Wiki will be more valuable to you than an hour spent listening to me in this lecture. <laughs> so really, you're wasting your time listening to me. You should spend an hour with a Tiddly Wiki. Important non-computer science things. Goodness. It's speeding up now. How long have I got? Five, four, three. Can I get like five minutes over, maybe? Maybe. OK. <laughs> uh, these are not computer science things. Learn to write. I was crap at writing. I learned to write. I wrote a few books. Uh, and, and after you've written a few books, you get good at it. But I was really rubbish at writing to start with. Were you rubbish at writing before you wrote your first book? Yeah, Francesco was rubbish at writing. <laughs> I mean, I was good at maths at school. I wasn't good at dots and commas and spelling. I uh, got a contract to write. Dave Thomas said, we've got people who can spell. You don't worry about the spelling. You know these proofreaders? They've got like funny brains. They see every spelling mistake. OK, three rules at work. If you get a bad boss, move immediately. Do not try to change them. The relationship comes first, Jane Barlerud. Engage with management. Hamming, the great Hamming, said the great mistake he made was not to engage with management until fairly late in his career. Um, that was my great mistake. I think I realized on the day I finally quit from Ericsson, it might have been a good idea to talk to the bosses, you know, just because they were, just because they were doing different things to me. didn't mean that I shouldn't talk to them. So you see, I, 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 if I'd followed Jane's rule, be friends with the management first, maybe things would have been different. Maybe things would have got a bit smoother and easier. Uh, seven distractions. <laughs> Open plan offices, the latest stuff, Twitter, Facebook, so notifications, turn them off. Links, links are horrible. You're doing something, oh, there's a link, oh, 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 really? Goodness, Boom. So books are really good because they've got links in. So you don't get distracted when you're reading a book. Turn off the internet, ban scrum and all this silly stuff. Uh, and remember, you can only do one thing at a time. Yeah. Six ways to get your boss to program in Erlang. <coughs> yeah, you can read that later. One thing to look for when applying for a new job. Look at the balance sheet of the company. Like okay, crazy, crazy, crazy engineers. They say, should I work for this company? I say, have you looked at the balance sheet? They say, no. I say, why not? Well, they're doing interesting technology. OK, so if, if your share price is going down, forget it because there will, there will be no room for innovation in that company. If the share price is going up and they've got excess profits, there will be room for innovation. So the first thing you look for is the balance sheet of the company. Right. Three general laws. Software complexity grows with time because we build on old stuff. Bad code grows out good and bad code contaminates good code. Oh. oh. Laws of physics and maths. Um, a computation can only take place when the data and program are at the same point in space-time. You know? So that's, that's actually why a lot of web things don't work. Because if you've got all the stuff in Java, the JavaScript in the browser, and you suddenly discover that some of the data you need is on the server, so you stop what you're doing, send a message to the server, and wait for an answer to come back, 
but then you might not get the answer come back and it becomes inconsistent and then suddenly all the problems occur so it's actually make sure your application will be really trivial to write if you make sure you've got all the data you need and you send it at the start so that the JavaScript doesn't have to stop and go and ask the server. Or use something like PHP. PHP is brilliant language, apart from the syntax and the semantics. Um, <laughs> um, be be because it takes a view that will perform everything in one place. So we'll do it all on the server where we have the database, where we have everything we need, and then we can send the answer to the browser. So, so you're not going to get these consistency problems between the data on the browser and the data on the server. Causality. Effect follows cause. We never know how stuff is. We know how it was in a remote system. We know how it was the last time it told us. We do not know how it is now. Most often, that doesn't make much difference. But in a lot of cases, it makes a lot of difference. You have to look at the time and so on. And entropy, entropy is always increasing. In, in the early days, Unix systems had a small disk. So programs that were not used were deleted to save disk space. And so the, pro the system evolved, getting better. Now we keep all versions forever on GitHub which I think is rather like junk DNA. You know, it's sort of in our bodies forever, and nobody knows what it's good for. No one will ever look at it. It's just crap. Get rid of it all. Uh, like, uh, I won't say that. Trust me. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is help, helping, helping, helping your non-technical your, your non, um, non neighbor. <laughs> Tell him it's not your fault. Tell them it's crap software. Tell them I don't understand this crap either. And tell them computers can't do everything. And tell them just because you're a computer scientist, you don't know how it works either. Right, the big ideas. Now we're getting to the big ideas, and, and it's speeding up. Uh, this is a big idea. Things can be small. They don't have to be gigabytes. Fourth compiler was 12 kilobytes. The fourth OS is 24 kilobytes. Kilobytes, we're not talking about gigabytes or megabytes. Uh, IBM DOS was less than 640 kilobytes. UCSD Pascal, too. Uh, uh, the old truths, keep these still true. Keep it simple, make it small, make it correct, fight complexity. Learning, kids can learn computing. Old age pensions, like me, can learn computing. Well, how come it was difficult? How come it was easy to learn basic back in the 80s and it's really difficult to program today? Right. And now, the web is broken. The web is completely broken. Why is it broken? Well, it's not symmetric. Very easy to read stuff, very difficult to write stuff. So we have a community of users who engage passively by reading stuff. They do not write stuff. They cannot write any page. Uh, you can't just change any page you see as you're browsing. Hey, I don't like that page. I'll change it. You can't do that. You can only change it in the way that the programmer who had written that page had intended. Uh, can, we, can we make new things by combining old fragments in new and flexible ways? No. And the web is dominated by a small number of companies. Amazon, Google, Facebook, using huge data centers. It should be controlled from the edge network. All these supercomputers that we have in our pockets, that's where the control should be. And the original vision of the web was citizen programming. You know, we hand out all these computers, and, and the citizens should use them for their mutual benefit. Look at some talks by Ted Nelson. So HTTP and HTPM, H, well, no, HTML have several problems. Uh, it's non-symmetric. It's easy to read, difficult to write. Pages get lost, they just disappear. You know this uh, 404 problem? Gone, gone forever. There's no, there's no way to reuse and to have attribution rights. There's no, there's no micropayments, anything like that. Uh, it's controlled by a very small number of companies. And what's the fundamental problem with HTML? It's lack of symmetry. If, if you say, if these B things say href is A, so the a, the, all these Bs knows who the A is. But the A doesn't know that all these Bs are pointing to it. So this A over here that they're pointing to, it doesn't know it's pointed to by the, the Bs. So the, the A person can just move to a new machine, rename you see, if A changes the name of the thing or becomes unavailable, it breaks all the Bs. So, you know, I've written a web page. People link to it. I didn't know they'd link to it. 
I say, nobody reads that web page, I'll delete it. I've now, I've now just coincidentally broken all these other web pages. So what you'd really want is something like that. You want the Bs to know about the A, and you want the A to know about all the Bs. So that if you moved the A, you could tell all the Bs. You want to do something like that. Um, one model where this kind of works quite well is the wiki. Because links can't get lost. They are in the same wiki space, like the Wikipedia. There's no such thing as a non-existent link. If you click on a link, you go somewhere. If, if you click on a link and that page doesn't exist, you say, hey, hey, you clicked on a link that doesn't exist. We'd like to create it. And then you create it. It's a very nice model. And it's very tightly, it's a tightly integrated system. Um, and it's all in one place. So it's got much less entropy than the web. The web is scattered all over the place. Um, when you go to the Wikipedia, basically you have to add new knowledge. You can't add old knowledge again, because really somebody will reject that knowledge. So you're slowly refining and improving this knowledge. It's highly intertwined. It's got very low entropy. And it's got a social model of building it where a large number of people can make small contributions. So it's actually a very good model of interaction. And it's not controlled by any single large corporation. And this goes back to the ideas of Xanadu. Now, Xanadu was an invention of Ted Nelson's. Uh, it's been called the longest vaporware project ever, because even after 50 years, it's never been implemented. It was really ambitious. In Xanadu, there would be no broken links by design. Broken links could not exist. There would be no difference between readers and writers. Data could be reused in any way. Attribution and copyright and all these things would be strictly enforced. You could charge for your work. You could say to what extent um, you wanted it to be reused. And in fact, the, 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 the fault lies in editors, in text editors. Because we can type text into an editor, we can just cut and paste a link and do that. If we had a fear improver together with an editor that manipulated the metadata, we could say, you know, you could ask, in a sense, in a contract, you know, am I allowed to, re am I allowed to quote from your slides? Yeah, you can. Do I have to pay to quote? How many copies? You know, you could put a little contract and say, here's a little fragment of information. I allow you, or I allow anybody to make 20 copies of this. I don't allow you to make 21 copies. And you could enforce this, actually. And you could, you could pay for it, um, or you could not pay for it. Or you could, you could have any degree from open source, completely open to closed source, and any sort of spectrum. And my goodness. Oh, well, only on slide 85 of 114. <laughs> so the problems. We've got to get rid of this 404 not found. So, you know, get rid of all that stuff. It's speeding up. What can we do? What can we do? OK. Hey, so you guys, let's unbreak the web. The web is broken. Let's go out and unbreak it. And let's bring computation back to these supercomputers that we've got in our pockets and bring the computation back to the edge network. And let's ensure that our personal data is owned by us and not by large corporations. And let's make computing easy again, like it was in the past. And let's build apps that can communicate with each other. And I, I've said before, I've said a program that is not secure and that cannot be remotely controlled should not be written. Or did I say? Yeah, I don't think it should be written. So we've given millions of people supercomputers. So let's make a system where they can use them. And now it's your turn to do this stuff. Not mine, because I've been doing it for so many years. And you're younger than me, and you're going to be around for a few more years. So go and do this stuff. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>